kickstarted project about 18 months ago to create a, or described as a Raspberry Pi sized supercomputer. Um, now, on this board is a Xilinx V chip, which gives you a couple of ARM cores. But the more interesting part is um, the um, a particular coprocessor which um, has 16 cores on this version and is incredibly good at doing floating point operations. So it's good for tasks like software defined radio and, and the like. Um, on the back, it has a number of links for connecting these boards together as well as a number of GPIO ports for any kind of input. Um, the code processor internally has um, each of these 16 cores has two um, ALU can do, uh, do two operations per clock cycle. Um, so you can do two single precision uh, two single precision floating point operations in a second, or one float and one integer per cycle, and being small chip, only 32 kilobytes of memory per core, as well as being able to communicate with each other. Um, to talk to each other, there are three different um, meshes, so each core has a router attached to it. Um, one for writing to other cores, one for reading data back, and a third for writing um, off the chip to, for example, um, the memory on the board which is shared with the ARM cores. Um, these cores can see each other as one global address space, so um, in its address space you can take the upper 12 bits and that will identify a call number so that you can read and write the internal memory or even the registers of another processor. Um, to program these, there are primarily two um, routes that you can go down, although on the parallel the forums there are projects to um, add, for example, an API. Um, on the left is where I um, spend most of my time with the project, is the, um, your, a standard GCC based tool chain so that you can if you're used to programming on Linux, you can treat it the same as any other device apart from your toolchain starts with a Piffin instead of x 6 or up. And, um, but with two um, special libraries, eLib, which is for software that runs on a device, and eHal, which allows you to write software to facilitate how these calls will talk to each other. Alternatively, the tools do support um, an OpenCL toolchain, uh, which unlike most other toolchains, use GCC instead of LLVM, um, where the Epiphany calls show up as an accelerator type so that you can use pretty much the same OpenCL code that you'd be using for your GPU, apart from the device type would change. Um, for writing a piece of software, you have to write two parts, one which runs on the Epiphany core. Um, all of these cores are completely independent, so that if you want, you can have all 16 cores doing the same thing, or if the task you want to achieve is more complex, you can have, you can write 16 different programs or anywhere in between, and have each core do a specific task. Now, for a small example, Hello World, everyone's favorite starting example. Um, for instance, in this example here, we're basically appending to Hello World the um, identifier of the core. So you can tell, for example, that you know this is the core in the bottom left of the grid. And it will copy that to some shared memory which is shared between the Epiphany cores and the um, ARM processor so that on the ARM side 
um, you can uh, read the data back in so that you can schedule another job, for instance. Now, the ARM code is a bit longer because there's a lot of setup code which you have to do just once in your program, and a bit of allocating memory so you can receive your data back. And in this short example, we are for each of the cores, um, we're creating a, um, a group of one pro um, processor, resetting it and loading our Hello World program. Now, to make this fit on the slide, obviously you probably want to read that data back to check that it's doing the right thing. But, so for example, um, for a more complicated example, um, cores can work together in groups. Uh, this is part of the code for the matrix multiply example, which 95% of the time if you've seen a parallel example, this is the code that will be running. So you have the concept of mailboxes for sharing, for sharing data between the host and the system, as well as barriers so that you can lock your room um, Make sure all your calls um, continue only go there. Only go beyond a certain point once they've all finished a task. Now all of these can be configured so that again, if you want half of your calls to only half of the chip to wait for one thing while the other half does something else, this is all configurable in the same API. Um, and on the host side, it's essentially the same except what you're taking is instead of in the previous example where we're saying we want to use one core one by, um, one by one core in a group to run a program, we're now running the same program on the entire chip. Um, that's roughly how it works. Um, a few things on how to get the maximum performance out of it. Um, firstly, you'd want to be able to um, measure how quickly your code is. So the um, eLib API includes access to uh, timers on board the chip, um, which can be used for measuring. In this simple example, we're just measuring how long the program takes, but for instance, you can measure how long you're waiting for stuff to run in memory. If you're pulling up data from memory, you might want to know how how long are you actually spending waiting for results to get back rather than actually doing computation? And other things as, you know, how many um, instructions have been issued as opposed to clock cycles, etc. Um, because the um, core has only 32 kilobytes of memory, obviously you probably want a larger program. Now, the um, Epiphany SDK has, um, comes with three linker scripts for um, each particular board. For those who don't know what a linker script is, this is a, essentially a mapping of the linker that will say, for this blob of code, put this in this fast place, for this part, place it in this slower place. So the trade is obvious. You have less faster memory, so if you can make your program fit in the fast memory, put that there. If not, try the next script along until your program fits. Or if you want to do something custom, you can write your own script. Um, one thing to note when you are doing communication between cores is that um, writing data to your neighbor is a lot faster than reading it. So it takes one cycle for data to move uh, between cores. So if you're requesting a piece of data, it will take the amount of time it will take to actually send a request for the data and get the data back, rather than just sending the data in the first place. So in this case, for communication, it can be um, as quick as twice as fast, depending on 
um, issue right instead of read. And also, one other thing, the calls um, have two DMA engines which can allow you to move data around the system in the background while you do something more interesting. So again, depending on how much, depending on how your program looks, you can copy data while you're computing the next set of results, etc. And to um, and the API has a uh, API compatible version of MemCopy that uses this to speed up a lot of code that uses MemCopy. Going back to um, what I was saying previously about linker scripts, um, in the next version of the um, SDK release, which will be either at the end of this month or the beginning of the next month, um, we're adding what we're kind of describing as a software cache, where instead of worrying about where you put data into, um, you know, try and make your program fit in internal RAM. If not, it's going to run extremely slow in the external RAM. Uh, we're extending the um, SDK to automatically copy functions from external RAM to internal RAM at runtime. So that if you call a function a lot of times and it's in external RAM, you have a slow, you have a penalty once of copying it into internal RAM but every other time it will run almost as fast as if it was in turn around in the first place, apart from a five cycle delay as it jumps through the internal data structure. And this will clean up code so that if you're no longer using a function, it will know this memory is now free, so I can replace it with another function, which again, depending on how your code looks, might also um, might speed this up without having to worry about manually placing everything in the right in a the correct place in memory to get maximum performance. One other thing that we'll, um, we'll also be adding is because debugging is always a pain, um, the next version of the SDK will have, or maybe not the next version, um, we're currently working on extending the e server which is um, for those that um, use GDB with embedded devices, you generally have GDB the client you run on your desktop and GDB server which is a program which talks to the board over JTAG or whatever, depending on your board. Um, historically this has been a a uh, quite difficult process where you'd have a different um, debug, um, you'd have to run a different debugger instance for every call. Whereas we're now improving that so that you, um, all the calls appear as an individual thread in the system so that when you call, ask for the program to break, it will <coughs> stop all the calls as close to each other as possible. This will also allow you to use, um, for example, the multi-core visualizer in Eclipse. Uh, for instance, on the right to the rather pixelated screenshot of showing the um, load across the mesh network to determine if your code is running slower because there is a specific link that's currently being overloaded. The source of this is available on GitHub, and if anybody wants, has a parallel and wants to try this um, new branch, this experimental branch, any feedback is welcome. Um, all the code for all the tools are on the Adaptiva GitHub repository. And one final thing, tomorrow we um, will be running a parallel workshop where those that haven't used a Parallela, you can choose from one of these, this nice stack of eight Parallelas to um, try running some programs on. Um, of course, if you have your own, the more, the more better. 
Um, thank you. The obituary bits are used to address a particular call. Is that so that we might see parallels with up to 4096 calls in the future? Do you think that's going to help for expansion? Um, I'm not sure in how expansion would be on that number of calls, but up to 4095 because call zero is special. Okay. Basically, all references to call zero is a reference to yourself. Okay. Sorry, how are calls allocated when you're putting your original code? Are they allocated at random or do they come up from a corner? Um, the tools have a, um, dis, um, there's a file that describes where they live in this address space. I don't know how that is initially set, but it's in a certain place for all parallel boards, though you can override it. It just occurs to me that if you've got a call that is very close to the bus, it's going to run faster than a call that's in the middle, because there's no, it's not a fully closed network, it's just a Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, one question. Is it, are these uh, independent units, or is there any way of connecting up calls um, together so you can get bigger arrays? No. Um, these, some of these connect on the bottom can connect boards together so you can have a bigger mesh. Right, okay. But yeah, so that's how you can expand that. Yes. Has there been much commercial interest in it or is it still very much an enthusiast device? I don't know. I may, I, I mainly work on the soft, I work on the software side of this so I don't know. Is, 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 that, is, that, is, is that professionally or is it a hobby? Professional. <clears throat> What, what would be good applications, apart from ray tracing, what would be good applications for parallelizing? Um, Sorry, can I, can I throw, yeah. Um, rapid factorization for starters. Um, there's also um, Bayesian analysis, any numerical analysis, which like DNA sequencing or things like that, um, crystallography. There's a lot of uh, biomechanical stuff that would be this would be really quite useful.